nature on the move. The river fills and flows while it peacefully meanders through the valley below. The Song Hong is such a river, but from 1964 until after the 12 days of Christmas 1972, there was nothing peaceful or serene about the Song Hong or the valleys through which it flowed. From the headwaters in China to its final resting place in the Gulf of Tonkin, the Song Hong passed through the most heavily defended real estate in the history of aerial warfare. During the air war in North Vietnam, the name of the river was translated, and every American pilot involved knew it well. The Red River was a landmark, and the valley through which it flowed was a graveyard. I'm just crossing the river now, uh, Steel, uh, Red River. Located in and adjacent to the Red River Valley was the largest industrial complex in North Vietnam. The capital city of Hanoi and the port of Haiphong were the very heart and soul of the communist political, economic, and supply systems. Defended by the largest surface-to-air arsenal ever assembled, it was both formidable and frightening. There were more SAMs, more anti-aircraft, more small arms, and even MiGs that had never been put in one area before. One in 40 who went there never came home. Courage, integrity, character, and performance were the only yardstick. Those who returned will never forget one another, nor will they ever forget those who could not return. Air Force Academy graduate Carl Richter, winner of the Air Force Cross in Vietnam, lost on his 198th mission. The Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association is composed of those who went there. Their mission, to fly and fight. Day and night, small formations of fighter and attack aircraft were hurled at targets in and around this valley. Trust and respect earned there is eternal, and well it should be. The men who would run this gauntlet of flak, fighters, and surface-to-air missiles would form a deep kinship with each other, with their airplanes, and with the men who prepared them. This bond was the catalyst upon which lives and successes were critically dependent. For the pilots of the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, the time had come. For those who had to go where no one else wanted to go, or could go, their time was now. Mission planning and target selection directed by Washington from 10,000 miles away, translated into a conventional day-to-day -day assault on a small area around Hanoi and Haiphong. This complex was defended by hundreds of interlocking radars, some 8,000 radar-controlled anti-aircraft guns, 150 fighter interceptors, an extensive surface-to-air or SAM network, and tens of thousands of small arms. Some of the missions over North Vietnam on this, on this present trip, I've seen some fire as intense and as accurate as any I've seen in the past. Strategies for penetrating this unprecedented and unparalleled air defense, while decreasing the losses, were expanded to increase coordination and communication. Tactics conferences involving wings and air groups based in Thailand, Da Nang, South Vietnam, and on the carriers on Yankee and Dixie Station were organized. The need to know one another professionally and socially evolved into an increased awareness of each other's capabilities and tactics. The pilots from uh, Uban were led by Robin Olds 
and we put he and Chappy James on the two lead elephants. We had six elephants. These elephants were brought to us from out in the countryside, and it took three days for them to get there and three days for them to go back home. Knowledge gained at these conferences was vital in increasing efficiency while greatly reducing casualties. The combination of lessons learned and camaraderie developed inspired future meetings. It was at one of these that our founder, Scrappy Johnson, suggested forming an organization and the Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association was born. The tactics and operational procedures developed through the networking of this new organization found their way into combat operations that began to unfold with an intensity that rivaled anything ever seen in the battle arena of World War II. The lessons learned were put to good use, but the missions were still costly. While some returned, many did not. Over 400 F-105s alone were downed over North Vietnam. Some 3,000 aircraft in all, their pilots either dead, wounded, missing, or captured. A fortunate few were rescued, thanks to the heroic efforts of the Jolly Green, Sandy, and the Air Sea Rescue crews that fighter and attack pilots hold to be among their number. But many were not. Few would disagree that war is an ugly thing, but it was John Stuart Mill in 1861 who argued that it is not the ugliest of things. Far worse, he said, is the decayed state of moral and patriotic feeling that thinks nothing is worth war. A man who has nothing for which he is willing to fight, said Mill, is a miserable creature who has no chance of being free unless kept so by the exertions of men far better than himself. If war is indeed an ugly thing, then few have been uglier or more consuming of the exertions of good men than the 12-year effort by the United States to curb communist expansion in Southeast Asia. It has been said about Vietnam that never in the history of human conflict have so many hampered, limited, and miscontrolled so few as in the air campaign against North Vietnam. The unconscionable objective of peace without victory cost dearly in American lives and suffering. Unbeknownst to the warriors, victory was being sacrificed in an attempt to win hearts, minds, and votes. To the men being launched from the carriers on Yankee Station and the air bases in Vietnam and Thailand, mission accomplishment was paramount, anything less unacceptable. Their trust and respect in and for one another and their country was their motivation. And they played hard in a very intense environment, establishing a bond that cannot be broken. They fought as much for each other as for their own survival. We were approaching the Red River when our number four man in our formation uh, made it known that he was critically low on fuel. It became obvious that uh, he wasn't going to make it back to the refueling tanker, so I thought I'd uh, do what I could to help him along. I thought possibly I might be able to get the nose of my airplane up against the tail of his and give him a push. In combat, you're taught flight integrity, where it's a, a team effort. Uh, everybody supports everybody else. So. Even though Earl's airplane was shot up and it was obvious that he was going down, I did not see how I could not stay with him. To 
to me, Bardo and his backseater, Steve Wayne, are uh, both heroes. They risked themselves for Bob Houghton and myself. Uh, I asked Bob as soon as we were on the ground, why, why would you do such a thing? And I don't have much of an answer other than uh, I just couldn't leave him behind. It was their concern for each other that led them to establish this unique fraternity of warriors known as the Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association. And I think the reason it has lasted as long as it has is because you had to do something to be a member, i.e. you had to fly in package six. And I think that there are a lot of people who would have loved to have flown in package six that didn't get the chance. There were a lot that didn't want to, and there were some that didn't have enough guts to. To all but a few, POWs became forgotten men in a forgotten war. The Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association developed a more active and formalized approach to the problem. In honor of these courageous comrades who had lost the freedoms they so valiantly defended, all future conferences would be known as practice reunions. The first real reunion would only be held when these brave warriors were released. At practice reunions in Karat, Thailand, Wichita, Kansas, and San Antonio, Texas, the River Rats, as they began to call themselves, circled the wagons to take care of their own. As their confinement continued, an effort that began with yard work, home maintenance, and washing cars evolved into financial assistance. The special needs of POW MIA families for involvement and information were recognized and met, and programs were designed to keep POW MIA issues in the all too forgetful public eye. In May 1972, a major communist invasion of the South reopened the air war over North Vietnam with a new ferocity. Operation Linebacker would unleash over 500 strike aircraft against the familiar targets of Rolling Thunder, now protected by defenses that the North Vietnamese had had five additional years to strengthen. Once again, the promise of victory was based on the premise of negotiation, as pilots saddled up and charged where most feared to tread. As their comrades before them, they cast their lot where other Corsairs, Crusaders, Intruders, Phantoms, Skyhawks, Thuds, and Vigilantes preceded them. The membership eligibility roles for the Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association grew significantly as thousands more Air Force, Navy, and Marine airmen carried the war to the North Vietnamese heartland. But it didn't get any easier. More and more men were lost, more men were missing, more men imprisoned. A reopening of the peace talks provided a two-month respite for both sides, but their collapse in December of 1972 opened an even more violent phase of the Vietnam War. For the first time, giant B-52 strategic bombers would be unleashed against North Vietnam in a campaign of unparalleled fury. Hundreds of B-52 crew members, previously restricted to bombing raids in the South, would join their fast-mover brethren in the skies over Hanoi and Haiphong. For the hundreds of new Red River Valley fighter pilots, the days and nights became a blur as men and planes were pushed to their limits. Within 12 days, the military and industrial complex of North Vietnam had been turned into a moonscape. Peace was at hand. However history remembers the outcome, the River Rats had served with pride, professionalism, and honor. By 
By 1973, it was essentially over. The planes were going home. And our POWs came home. Many after seven long years of captivity under unspeakable conditions. But even with their return, nagging questions arose about the fate of those still unaccounted for. I know I've spoken before and told of when the Vietnam POWs returned home. I was governor of California then. And Nancy and I were fortunate enough to have several hundred of them in a number of groups in our home. And we heard such stories, saw such courage. But one night afterward, when they'd gone, I said to Nancy, where did we find such men? And the answer came almost as quickly as I'd asked. We found them where we've always found them. On the farms, in the shops in the offices, stores, on the streets, in the towns and cities of America. They're just the product of the greatest, freest system man has ever known. With peace came the opportunity for the river rats to reflect on the past and take stock of the future on a slightly more leisurely basis. In the River Rats reunion since the first real one of 73, the rats have addressed the issues and challenges of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Come and sit by my side if you love me. Do not hate But remember the Red River Valley And the cowboy that loved you so true From this valley they say you are leaving We will miss your bright eyes and sweet smile I tell you, I've been in the Air Force for 20 years. As a kid, I flew with the old guys, and I'm, I'm looked upon as an old guy by the kids in the Air Force today. And I never felt a closer bond than the guys I flew with and got fired at with and lived and almost died with. And there just ain't no other way to put it. God bless you. Amen. This is a great reunion because you have the heart and soul of America right here. That's our 23rd year, and, and uh, you know, we're looking forward to our 25th. And it's going to be just absolutely super. There with Pentagon. Pentagon, one all that's good, good tours. Yeah, yeah, one of those good tours. Made you want to go back Southeast Asia again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fighting over there at least was face to face. And we just discovered that he probably uh, uh, provided the Iron Hand cover for one of my uh, most memorable flights. That's yeah. also called, known as Wild Weasel. Yes, yeah, Wild right. Weasel. Boom! This big old explosion, this big Sam explodes right in front of the whole 16 airplane, see? And Sam. And Spark says, Mr. regard to Sam at 12 o'clock. <laughs> well, what the hell? It wasn't real Sam. One name to you. One name to me. One name to you. It was damn close. Of particular importance to the rats were the financial needs of college-bound children of fighter and attack pilots lost in Southeast Asia. A program that was initially funded by the proceeds of bumper sticker sales has now provided over 600 grants representing more than $700,000 in scholarships. I remember the first scholarship fund we had, we only were able to raise $3,000 and we gave three $1,000 scholarships. Our kids, as we affectionately call them, are a source of pride and admiration, second only to that which we hold for their moms 
and the respect and gratitude we have for their dads, our wingmen. It is a fraternity of people that care very much about what went on in Vietnam, and they care very much about the kids, and more recently, they care about what happened in Desert Storm. Former F-105 pilot and retired Colonel Bob Gadd has orchestrated the River Rat Scholarship Program for over 12 years. It's uh, heart-rendering to, to see the, the emotion that, that flows from these kids when, uh, when we meet them face to face. We have children uh, or young people now who uh, ha are graduates, doctors, uh, PhDs, lawyers, uh, musicians, uh, the gamut. We have graduates from just about every academic discipline. I would like to take the opportunity to introduce you to two of our kids, Nick Donato and Susan Basilovac. You've really, really done a lot for me, and, and the, the problem is that I can't really give you the thanks you deserve unless you understand just how much it is that you've done for me. I, on the other hand, am a 28-year-old father of uh, three and husband. Uh, furthermore, I never graduated from high school. I have a learning disability. And I'm a recovering drug addict. You guys gave me a chance. You awarded me a scholarship, and in doing so, gave me and my family a chance for a better life. You reopened those closed options. And with your support, this high school dropout has managed to uh, pull off straight A's ever since. I was two years old when my dad was shot down. Um, so I never really knew him. But like I said this afternoon, look, looking around this crowd just gives me a really good idea of what he would have been like if I had known him. You're a very wonderful group. And you, keep, you take care of your own. And that's what it's all about. Thank you. What began some 25 years ago, today stands as a proud fraternity of warriors dedicated to the service of our nation, to our comrades in arms, to the families of our number who paid the ultimate price for freedom, and to future generations of Americans who may again be called to serve the nation in time of war. I never dreamed that the river rats would last this long. I'm sure that any of us who was originally involved in the formation of the river rats thought it would last this long. I'd like to say at this time that I uh, wish every, every river rat Godspeed and live a long time and come to the 50th reunion. Camaraderie is a byproduct. Heritage is the catalyst. The sacrifices of those who preceded, served with, and followed are the foundation of today's successes in the Gulf. Will they be forgotten? Never. The dedication to the families of their comrades in need of scholarship assistance continues unabated. The organizational pledge to use whatever means are available to ensure our country never again commits troops to a war we don't intend to win is a solemn oath. The commitment to educate the American public on the virtues of state-of-the-art equipment and solid support for our fighting men is an eternal vigil. Emphasis on heritage is manifested in today's machines and the men who fly them. It was with great pride that we watched General Chuck Horner, one of our own, lead a magnificent new generation of fighter pilots to victory in the skies over the Gulf. If, in fact, a major goal of the Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association has been to focus public awareness on POW MIA issues, few activities have been more visible or moving than this memorial at the United States Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. Today we dedicate a war memorial, a memorial to men lost in a war we were not allowed to win. This memorial is dedicated to all American airmen who were lost in Southeast Asia. 
It is the commemoration of their dedication to freedom and their sacrifice for this great nation. The Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association hereby entrusts this memorial to the United States Air Force Museum for the benefit and knowledge of future generations of visitors so they may remember the war in Southeast Asia. May it also serve to remind us all of our priceless heritage and preserve the memory of those that did not return. May they never be forgotten. The Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association is proud to officially present this memorial to the Air Force Museum. The Red River Valley was the most heavily defended piece of real estate in the history of aerial combat. They fought, bled, lived, and died there. Together they faced the valley of death. Together they still stand. And forever they will be known as river rats. Yes, one in 40 who went there never came home. Those who did will never forget those who could not. My home.